going to lead into us. And hopefully we can go inside tonight. Sometimes the hindrance is not on the outside. Sometimes the hindrance is inside. And fighting certain things that we ought to get over. I want you to notice, uh, just to reiterate the story quickly, David, of course, did what he did with Bathsheba and Uriah. And he had it secret, so the Lord told on him. Now the saints told me the Lord won't tell. I'll tell it to Jesus and he won't tell. Uh, <laughs> but the Lord uh, told Nathan. So the Lord did tell on David this time. And Nathan came to him and treated him with the respect that was due him, but gave him a little story about two men in one city. One was rich, the other poor. And of course, the poor man had a visitor, and the rich man, the rich man had a visitor. And instead of using his own flock, he took the poor man's one ewe lamb. And David responds in verse 5, the scripture said, and David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. And he said to Nathan, as the Lord liveth, the man that hath done this thing shall surely die. And he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. And Nathan said to David, thou art the man. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I anointed thee king over Israel. I delivered thee out of the hand of Saul. I gave thee thy master's house and thy master's wives into thy bosom and gave thee the house of Israel and of Judah. And if that had been too little, I would moreover have given unto thee such and such things. Wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? Thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword, hast taken his wife to be thy wife, and hast slain him with the sword of the children of Amnon. And of course the Lord then spoke punishment upon the house of David. And David responds in 13, and he says unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan said unto David, the Lord also hath put away thy sin, thou shalt not die. How be it because of this deed thou hast given? Great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. The child also that is born unto thee shall surely die. And then Nathan left. Isn't that sort of sad? Last thing he said as he walked out the door. Now I want you to notice 15. And the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife bare unto David, and it was very sick. And therefore David, of course, besought God for the child. And David fasted, went and lay all night upon the earth. And the elders of his house arose and went to him to raise him up from the earth. But he would not, neither did he eat bread with them. And it came to pass on the seventh day that the child died. The servants of the David feared to tell him that the child was dead. For they said, Behold, while the child was yet alive, we spake unto him, and he would not hearken unto our voice. How will he then vex himself if we tell him that the child is dead? And when David saw that his servant whispered, David perceived that the child was dead. Therefore David said unto his servants, Is the child dead? And they said, He is dead. Then David arose from the earth, washed, anointed himself, changed his apparel, and came into the house of the Lord and worshipped. Then he came to his own house. And when he required, they set bread before him, and he did eat. Then said his servants unto him, What thing is this that thou hast done? Thou didst fast and weep for the child while it was alive, but when the child was dead, thou didst rise and eat bread. And he said, while the child was yet alive, I fasted and wept, for I said, who can tell whether God will be gracious to me that the child may live? But now he is dead. 
Wherefore should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. I want you to notice 24, incidentally, just, just in passing. Just in passing. And compare it to 15. 15 says, Nathan departed into his house, and the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife bear unto David. 424 says, and David comforted Bathsheba, his wife. I thought that was interesting. And went in unto her and lay with her, and she bare his son and called his name Solomon, and the Lord loved him. Look at somebody and say, get up. It's over. <sighs> I wrestled with this because I figured in a conference such as this, we have heard enough of the lofty things of God and the philosophical and the significantly deep things of God that somehow to get personal can be a problem. Get personal. I noticed one of the things that God has done in his word is that he has proven to us that he can deal with sin. I see I'm going to have to work hard tonight. <laughs> it, is, it, is, it, is, it is significant because oftentimes if you were raised in the atmosphere that I was raised in, you would have difficulty being in the house of God dealing with not being perfect. Even as you sojourn in a place of this magnitude and enjoy the grandiloquent presentation of God in various aspects, you still have to deal with who you are. And oftentimes we, we act as if God does not know how to deal with folk messing up. It's interesting because we have to wear so many faces within the parameters of the ministries that we are a part of because none of us ever want anybody to think that we could be struggling with anything at all. I noted that a sinner goes through Calvary and becomes a saint. But immediately after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, he goes into intercession. And it strikes me as difficult to see the next step is moving from Calvary to intercession. Well, certainly he died for the sinner who through Calvary became a saint. But then he moves to intercession for those who have come through Calvary to indicate that maybe those folks who come through Calvary into the church might need somebody 
to help them to get from the church to glory. <sighs> Nobody steps from natural to spiritual without going through carnal. Uh, oftentimes, even in, in, in ministries, we feel like we have to explain why certain people are struggling in our churches. Because after all, my church is holy. Uh, Bishop Clarence Moore from West Virginia, he said to me, I can take my time tonight. I'm going to the mountain, I'm just going a little slow. He, 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 he said to me, he said, he said, Bishop Jones, would you like to have a clean church? And I said, yes. I mean, I, I would love to have a clean church. That's, that's what I'm preaching for, is to have a clean church. He says, I tell you what you do Sunday. He says, put everybody out of it and, and make sure you don't go in it yourself and you will have a clean church. And I look around at so many ministries today and I think that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to have a clean church because they're driving everybody who needs some help outside. It's significant to understand this. That God knows how to deal with sin. And I don't have to explain why a homosexual trickled into my church. I don't have to explain why the fornicator or the adulterer trickled into the house of God. Because when I go to McDonald's, it's because I'm hungry. If I go to the hospital, it's because I'm sick. And if I come to church, it's because there's something in me that needs a fresh word from the Lord to help me to get over where I am. There's a yoke of conditioning that is obvious here because church people didn't get messed up the way they are overnight. I didn't get this way overnight. And even though I've been through Calvary, it takes the Spirit of God time through experiences by His choice to break the yoke of my conditioning. If you would just take a look, for instance, at, at Jacob, or, or just look at Samson, and in the text David, you will find that these men had a yoke of conditioning. There was, there, there was something that God had to break in them outside of their circumstance or their situation. Why? Because as you grow in life, first of all, we have this proclivity in the flesh. And the world that we are a part of feeds our flesh. And through our flesh, control and place things in our minds. When I come to the Lord Jesus Christ, he moves in my spirit. And he uses his word through the power of his spirit to awaken my spirit. And now there is a war between my flesh and my spirit for my mind. Now you will notice that I have to be renewed by the transforming of my mind. Because when I came into the house of God, I didn't come in blank. I came in already with some deep-seated issues that the Holy Spirit has to work out of me. I didn't come into the house of God 
without having been conditioned to give in to the proclivities or the natural tendencies that Satan built on in my flesh. Oh, I'm looking at a group of folk who had to come into this place of God under the drawing of the power of God because you didn't get in here easily. The Lord had to suru or drag you because your conditioning was so negative that it took a cataclysmic move of God to even get you into the house of God. Sometimes just to get to church is a struggle. And folk are looking for you to dance, honey. I, j just to get in here was a struggle. And you're looking at my weakness, but I know I'm saved. Because before I was saved, I wouldn't even fight about what I do. But now I know something else is working. Because even though I don't have the victory yet, I'm still fighting the best fight I can give until the victory comes. Oh, I feel God in this place. Oh, that yoke of conditioning. I am convinced that nobody can start anew until that yoke is broken. Because you can take me out of my situation, put me in another situation, but if I'm that same old person yoked to my same old junk in my mind, even though I'm not in the place, my mind is still controlled by what Satan has left in me. It is here then that the child of God must find a place in God where they understand that even though I'm not there yet, there is something in me, the spirit of God, through the word of God that wars against the flesh. And yes, yes, they said it would be all right everything's gonna be all right when you come to church I just wish somebody would have told me when because to this point I'm still fighting oh I feel like having church oh, I touch somebody say I'm still fighting I, I look sanctified uh, uh, the yoke the yoke the yoke the yoke there is a yoke because you have been schooled in a certain way and the thing is that Satan has moved now to give us everything that we can get before we meet God so that we will have battles like you will not believe. Now some people who never had problems with certain things are quick to judge others who are struggling with those things. But you didn't really overcome anything. It was never a problem with you even when you were in the streets. Oh God, I know that's true. <laughs> Some things you never did and wouldn't do. But the person beside you, little did you know, they're coming from a depth of sin that you could never comprehend. But the same God that brought you is the same God that brought them and the power of God is going to be seen in their lives. That's why you got to learn to pray for folk instead of talking about folk. I'm going there, just real, real can I, you know. You've got to understand then that, that, that this leads me to the question of guilt. Because the church is the place where guilt ought to be removed. It is not the place where we control by guilt. Because that's what Satan does in keeping us from moving forward with the vision God has given us. He endeavors to keep us looking backwards instead of forward. And because of the issue of guilt, most of us sit in apprehension of what may happen in our lives instead of anticipation. The child of God should always anticipate and not apprehend because anticipation is my spiritual link and apprehension is my flesh link. The war then is for me to walk with God, not in apprehension, but rather in anticipation. 
I'm not looking for any more negatives. The negatives are behind me. But if I maintain a level of guilt because I can't get over what I've done, then I will apprehend judgment instead of anticipate deliverance. It is here that I want to pick up because it is noteworthy that the Hebrew very concept of guilt is rasha, one word, is to act wickedly. And the second meaning is to condemn as guilty. One writer says it denotes the negative behavior of evil thoughts, words and deeds, a behavior that is outside of God's character, but is also hostile to the community. And at the same time, it betrays an inner disharmony and unrest of a person. And what he says, and I and now unquote, is that anytime I am wrestling with an evil behavior, it does not only act as an outward situation, but it moves and it messes with my harmony. Anytime I act incorrectly to the things of God, to the things of my community, it intensifies a negative attitude in myself. The next word is a shem, and it, it moves now, it centers on guilt, but it moves from the act, it moves from the punishment, and it moves into the condition of guilt that sets up in an individual. Now you have to understand that guilt is going to be there because of the conviction of the Holy Spirit. I cannot operate outside of God's characteristics as a child of God and not be hit with an intensive display of the inner guilt. Why? Because the Holy Ghost keeps me in line by showing me inwardly when I'm wrong. I have now got to be able to handle my wrongness in a constructive manner in order to move from that point to the next. The word is interesting because, Hashem that is, because it contrasts punishment and redemption. And it declares that a shem can be a punishment in and of itself, not any outward action, but simply the guilt itself that is in me because of my deeds. I'm taking my time. As we go further, I'll give you another statement to that effect. Guilt then can be so overpoweringly crippling, it distorts of my mental faculties and in one translation they say when you bear one's guilt you go mad guilt is the kind of thing that can so envelop you that you're looking for more punishment than God intends to give guilt can be so overpowering that it shuts down your faith because guilt and faith don't go together. I don't care what we've been promised. If I can't master dealing with my guilt to understand where and what God has done with it, what's going to happen is I'm going to sit in the house of God and anticipate calamity because of past behavior than to look for God to remove it and bless me. Oftentimes we go to prayer and because of my condition I thought as a child if I did something wrong in the holiness church that God would get me this is how I was raised the Lord's going to get you I mean I was so messed up that I thought the Lord wanted to come back and catch me wrong that's how they taught you know the Lord's coming back just as soon as you do wrong, he's going to crack the skies. And oh my God, I was raised then on guilt. I mean, I was just nervous all the time. I had no freedom to praise the Lord because in my mind, I would think about the little 13 year old stuff that I did. And immediately I was thrown into a traumatic mental madness of guilt. But I'm glad I grew up to understand that anyone who hung on a cross like he did surely couldn't want
going to come and catch me still in sin. It would seem to me if he died for me like that, he would want me to at least be caught up to meet him in the sky. But I was raised on guilt. And it becomes so overpowering until guilt now has been described as the place where religion and psychology most often meet. And they claim that there is no other topic that is equally significant to the theologian as well as to professional counselors as guilt. Because guilt has found its way into every psychological problem. If I am depressed, I am depressed because I cannot handle certain situations. And when I can't handle certain situations, I think something is wrong with me. So instead of dealing constructively with what I'm going through, I sit and judge myself negatively because I claim now that I am the reason why I am feeling this way. Guilt is the underscore of loneliness because now I'm alone and nobody calls and I'm sitting here now feeling like I must be no good, I must be not worthy and I must be less than everybody else because I don't have anybody. Now it could be that I'm very special and can't nobody deal with how special I am. Uh, but, but guilt says something is wrong with you why nobody wants you. Struggling with marital problems and so immediately I take it on myself that I am the reason my marriage is in trouble and I'm sitting here fighting with the guilt of it and making myself sick because I have taken on the problems of my marriage and I am the reason if I wasn't so low down if I wasn't so evil if I could just be better if I just knew the answers sometimes folk just don't want you sometimes people just can't stand you sometimes Sometimes folk just don't want to deal with you. Sometimes you feel then that guilt comes in to homosexuality and when you're struggling to keep straight and struggling to do the right thing and the thoughts come back to you and you say to yourself my god I must be sick to even think what I'm trying to get out of sometimes you were turned out as a child somebody else did it to you and you know you're in the hand of a master when you were guilty for what somebody else has done to you and then they condition you not to talk when you're in an abusive situation because they are going to use guilt to keep you from exposing what's being done to you but now you end up the recipient of negative guilt that's holding you and binding you even further can you imagine having to fight depression, having to fight loneliness, having to struggle with marital problems, struggle with homosexuality, alcoholism, and even grieving for somebody that's dead, and still have to deal with your guilt. In other words, all of my problems become more pronounced when I am dealing with feeling guilty for what I'm going through. I I feel God in this place. Somebody's going to break out of here tonight. You've got to understand this. If it's involved then in all of the psychological problems, then my mind is overcome with my problems and intensified by the guilt I feel about myself. So when I come into church, not only do I have problems, but I'm guilty. My guilt is fighting my faith. So now I'm sitting here wanting to rejoice but I feel like crying then I sit beside somebody who feels like I ought to be rejoicing and now they're going to make me feel even more guilty for sitting here <laughs> oh, 
I feel the spirit of God here. I did not come to church for you to judge me. Since you have so much discernment, can't you discern that maybe I need somebody? Oh God, I, I, guilt. Guilt, you see, you see, you see, there's legal guilt, of course. And, and I know I, I broke the law and I, I went too fast and the police stopped me. That's legal guilt. There's social guilt where it's not always written what the law is, but, but you break sometimes an unwritten rule. You talk about somebody on the phone and the person you're talking to has the other person listening. You know, and you know, they do that to you. And, and, and then of course you feel real bad because uh, you said some things you wouldn't have said if you didn't if you knew uh, you know how you do <laughs> and, and, and that's social guilt and then then there's personal guilt when when you have made yourself some promises and you decided that uh, I'm not gonna get caught up in this circumstance again and then you find yourself right back in it and now you're not only sick of being in the circumstance but now you're sick of yourself for having and gotten back in the same thing you said you were trying to get out of. Oh God, so I violate my personal standards. Sometimes you can just get guilty for having dessert on your diet when you decided you weren't going to eat any more sweets after 12. And, and I'm guilty. And, and then so, so I'm always walking around in apprehension instead of anticipation. I'm just living a life full of guilt. And then I I sneak into the church of God and I wish I could talk to somebody who understands problems without judging individuals that's why I came to the conference because I hope somebody would preach a word here that would help to set me free oh God I feel your presence in this house because I'm going out of here with no baggage touch somebody say I'm getting ready to drop my baggage off I'm getting ready to leave my issues right here because I'm going on to see about this vision God has promised me and I can't get forward looking backward oh, I got to preach this thing here oh God and of course there's there's theological guilt and according to what I understand theological guilt is actually the only true guilt because all this comes inside and it leaves me uncomfortable as shem with an uncomfortable feeling of regret now i've got remorse i've got shame and i've got self-condemnation i'm not only fighting satan but i'm fighting myself and if i don't get some help inside where I'm blocking the Spirit of God who wants to move through me and wash me of all of the mess that has accumulated in my mind. And so I need the Spirit of God to deal with the sting of inner guilt. This discouragement, this anxiety, this, this, this sense of isolation. Because now instead of moving through with a sense of security that God is on my side. I am shrinking back now. My prayer life is coming to a close because I won't even speak to God because I don't deserve anything from God. So people are being blessed around me and I think it's because they're living so good and, and I must not be living too good because I'm not blessed. Let me tell you something. If God were to regard iniquity, nobody would be blessed I wish somebody to help me here tonight 
God does not bless you because of how good you are. God blesses you because of your faith in him. I, I feel the spirit of God here. It's not how good you are because your goodness is as filthy rags. Uh, you can't brag about how good you are because God knows the stuff you never talk about. I don't want to mess with you tonight, but you know and I know and God knows. God knows the inner things that you never bring out. The things that you have kept secret and made a hypocrite out of yourself because there are folks around you you can't talk to and tell them you're struggling. I wish I had a church where I could walk in and folk forget what the newspaper says and forget what the cousins and neighbors say and walk right in and look at the preacher and holler I need help. Do you have the power to deal with what I'm going through because I need somebody that knows how to pray for me. Can I preach this thing like I feel it? Shake somebody's hand and say I may be holy but I'm not innocent. I wish somebody would help me tonight. I want to talk to some real saints. All you stuck up folk, I don't want to talk to you. I want to talk to real folk. Look at your neighbor dead in the eye. Say I'm trying to be holy but I'm not innocent. I've been through some junk. Oh God, that qualifies me to help somebody. I feel it in here. Mm. All right. I tell you what we'll do. We'll get a two-year-old baby to preach to you. No, not qualified. Ain't been through enough to talk to me. I need somebody that's been to hell and back. Now that's who can talk to me. I need somebody who knows what it's like to be messed up with nobody to go to. Now send them to me. I can relate to that, but I can't relate to some stuck up folk who act like they've never done anything. Who I feel the spirit of God. Guilt. It possesses your mind and it holds you. It, it makes you impotent. It, it, it gives you a loss of self-esteem. And it leaves you walking through the house of God looking for punishment. The Lord's gonna get you. Every time I look in my Bible, I see healings. I see deliverances. I see the power of God in the lives of folk. Can I preach it like I feel it? Sometimes I, I look at David, for instance, and, and I don't understand how people can look at other people and disqualify them because of their mistakes. Oh, yes, that's why you can't testify where you're coming from and what you used to be because people will look at you like you're still there. Ah, uh, you can't, you, you can't, you better not tell anybody you used to be on the streets. <laughs> and you know I used to be a drug pusher. <laughs> Folk will look at you like, my, my, my. <laughs> well, look who I'm sitting beside this Sunday. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> And then so you're sitting there trying to act like you don't understand that woman who just came in with a mesh dress with no slip. Oh God, oh, you're about to die. You're about to lose your mind. Quit playing, come on. You know and God knows that you understand everywhere she's been. And if you would just tell the truth, you would bring her out of her state into a place. I feel the spirit of God in here. 
it's important to understand this that guilt when I walked into your church I came in burdened I came in broken and if I need anything in the house of God I need some real people I read Samuel chapter 12 but it didn't stop me from reading Psalms 23 Psalms 23 still brings tears to my eyes even though I know the writer messed up awful bad every time I read Psalm 24 it still sets my soul on fire oh God touch somebody and say if God forgives me Oh, I ain't worried about you. <laughs> if God forgives me. <laughs> uh, I feel a breakthrough coming in this place. <laughs> I feel God helping somebody. <laughs> the ugliness of the mistake. <laughs> Uh, when you look at the text then and you look at how ugly this thing is uh, who did it David uh, uh, well who is David uh, uh, not a pimp uh, David is the psalmist uh, he is the man who has been enveloped in the arms of God uh, he has been raised in the power and the demonstration of God he has been enjoying the beauty of being in God's presence you've got to understand this is a man that God anointed and a man who has had great victories with God but you've got to remember this that there is a yoke of conditioning that runs through the flesh of everybody sitting in this room 95% of the time you can be on the job full of spiritual vigor and vitality but there's five percent of that danger time when your mind begins to move in old places oh God you can sit right here in the house of God with the spirit of the Lord bouncing off the wall and all of a sudden a thought a sort of flashback runs across your mind then you think it for about five or six seconds and and then the Holy Ghost kicks in and catches a thought and then you hit yourself on the head loose your hole oh yeah <laughs> thought it for about five minutes and when the Holy Ghost caught you then you went to rebuking the devil you can sit right in the house of God and have the wildest flashback that your mind can give oh it's not 95% of the time 95% of the time you're on the mountaintop praising the God dancing up and down the aisles but there are times in your life no matter how holy you are when you got to fight sometimes things you had the victory over try to creep back in your life sometimes people you thought you long got over call you on the phone and send shimmers through your body that's the time you know not to hang with weak folk I wish somebody to help me here that's the time you got to hang with folk that's holding on and sometimes when your test is on you you don't want to deal with no hallelujahs you want to deal with folk that will go along with whatever you do I wish I could preach to some real folk sometimes God has to mess up your plans or you would mess up 95% over 5% of madness I feel like preaching in here tonight I feel God this is the message Lord 
but thank you. You've got to understand this. Here is a man, and I can imagine him saying, if I had been on the job, if I had gone with my armies, I would not have been caught in this situation. If I had done what God had called me to do, I would not have been in this place. Why did I have to be on the rooftop? Don't believe the movies. Bathsheba didn't come out there to tempt him. He was tempted just because of his yoke of conditioning. 53 years old, he was not a spring chicken, had been through more women than most men at his time, but he had a yoke that he would not let go of. Here he is. Why didn't I have the strength? Because David, you gave in to it all the time. And so now what do I do? If you will notice further, he now has to deal with Uriah and Uriah would not go home. He says to him, man, go on to the house. Go on and see your wife. I know she's over there waiting. But Uriah would not go home. Here's what got Uriah killed. He was too faithful. He was faithful to the duties that David should have been handling. And now I can hear David like the president. Why why couldn't I own up to it? Why couldn't I have just said I was wrong? Because you got to deal with some folk that instead of accepting your mistakes, they'd rather you cover them and make them worse. I feel like preaching. Touch your neighbor and say, neighbor, you're not like that, are you? Uh, you're not like that, are you? I wish I had a church that no matter matter how weak I was I wouldn't have to cover my sin but I could walk in the house of God and look at somebody sitting there and say come pray with me I'm going through a bad time and so what David did now is he kills Uriah because he wouldn't go home and here now he's caught in a situation where he's trying to sit on the lid can you imagine 95% of your life you have walked with God given him everything you know how to give and here it is that you're threatening an eternal relationship for a one night stand haven't you ever been that foolish where everything you have served God for stands in the balance over one one act of folly and the sad part about it is that God will love you with the evidence when people hate you on speculation I feel like preaching in here tonight I feel like lifting him up touch your neighbor say it's still hope for you we're not throwing you away because there's still some value in you as an individual I feel some pushing me now. Can I take it a little further? Here is David's weight because he's got to deal with Bathsheba's pain. And now we're moving into the calamity of consequence because Bathsheba's pain is now on David because he's got to live with it the rest of his life. Here is the terror of the mistake. Not only is he dealing with it, but he's got to deal with Bathsheba's pain. Let's talk about her pain. She commits adultery. She's pregnant by a man who was not her husband. She's hiding her first pregnancy and it should be special. She loses Uriah, a monogamous man who makes her a queen in his little house. She loses her first child and now she's got to spend the rest of her life with a police 
polygamous man who makes her just another woman in the house. I feel like preaching in here. I feel like having some church. Oh, David, how can you get over this? Not only have you embarrassed Israel, but the monarchy has been defiled. You have embarrassed the name of God because the name of the Lord is being blasphemed. You have brought destruction into your own family and all of this is sitting on your head. Can I take you to that point I wanted to mention? And here is the point. The perpetrator has got to become the victim of the consequence of his own behavior. Can I say that again? Anytime God is going to bring you out, he has to make you who is the perpetrator. He's got to make you the victim of your own behavior. Then something on the inside begins to cry out to God. I feel it in here. Can I take you to point number two? And I'm getting ready to close tonight. But can we go just a little higher? Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, the only thing that can get this guilt off of David is a relationship with God. I got to preach it in here. The only thing that can cause him to recover from that kind of psychological dilemma is I got to know God. Because if I don't know God, I blow my brains out. Shake somebody's hand like you're going to shake it off. And say, neighbor, the only reason I'm still in church with all I've done is my relationship with God. I feel the Holy Ghost here. You've got to understand it. Seven days, the child is sick. And it took the child for David to get down on his knees. There's times in your life where you got to forget folk and forget how they think. This is my soul that I'm trying to pull up here. And I'm tired of walking in the church with a face like I got it all together. I've got some abortions. I've got some thieving. I've got some bad attitudes hanging over me. And I don't care how you talk about blessing. I got to free myself from what's inside in order to walk with God. I've cheated too many times on my eye statement for me to just have joy my conscience is bothering me sometimes the Lord exposes to save so here come Nathan pointing at David thou art the man but he puts him down with the innocent child and I feel David as he begins to write Psalms 51 for he's laying out before the Lord touch your neighbor say it ain't about your profession now it ain't about being king now it ain't about being pastor of the biggest church in town it ain't about being a deacon it ain't about being a singer it's about being a friend with the God of your salvation so I heard him when he said I acknowledge my transgression and my sin is ever before me. I can't sleep at night. I can't eat in the morning. I can't move around. I can't praise you because my sin is driving me crazy. But I want to know, Lord, I can't talk to you right because he's already dead. I can't talk to 
of the saints because they want to talk about me looking for a reason to put me down but against thee and against thee only have I sinned and done this evil in my sight but Lord remember I was shaping in iniquity and in sin my mother did conceive me but I do know that I am wrong pull on somebody tell them you coming out tonight you getting ready for your blessing you coming out so he cried out to God have mercy upon me oh God according to thy loving kindness purge me with his son and I shall be clean wash me and I shall be whiter than snow touch your neighbor say I need a washing I need a washing I need a washing don't be so stuck up tonight that you won't admit it I need a washing I came to Dallas to get a washing wash me through thy truth thy word is truth then create in me a clean heart oh Lord and renew within me a right spirit cast me not away from thy presence and somebody holler take not the Holy Spirit shake somebody's hand say I still got it I've been weak but I still have the Holy Ghost restore unto me the joy like shouting can I preach just a minute I know you're tired but touch three people real quick now tell them the child is dead it's time to get up the child is dead I feel the Holy Ghost can I preach it here touch somebody else say the child is dead it's time to get up the innocent child he's already dead he was nailed through the inner metatarsal space of his foot. The child is dead. He was nailed through the carpal and the radius bone. The child is dead. He had a crown of thorns on his head. He was pierced in his side. He was laid in a tomb. The child is dead get up and tell the devil it's over hallelujah the abortion is over you can't change it you're crying all night but it's over it's over the marriage is over he won't Jail term is over. Get up. Tell the devil I'm ready to praise the name of the Lord. I'm ready to shout like I never shouted. I'm ready to lift him up. I feel like preaching. I feel like rejoicing. Grab your neighbor. Say, I ain't got time to judge you. I got to praise it myself. Open your mouth and lift him up. It's over. Get up. Go on. It's time. Hallelujah. The devil is a liar. If I'm going to sit here and let the devil keep me looking back when all of my life is in front of me, oh God, the reason he wants you in your past is because you got too much future and you can't go this way. You got to turn around and tell the devil it's all. It's my time. It's my time. 
consequence of my own behavior but I'm getting up now where is that pastor wanted to resign don't resign get up now uh-huh uh-huh where is that singer don't think you're blessed anymore get up now when God anointed you with that gift before the foundation of the world he knew you would come to this point the thing that's going to revive you is your relationship Holy Spirit, just this uh, descend in this place right now. I want you to take one person by both hands. I want you to get one partner by both hands. Get somebody. It's over. From that baby's conception to that baby's birth plus seven days. But it's over. I don't want you to even act like you gotta make somebody feel like you are all that. Cause you don't have to do it. You don't have to write a bad check because God knows your heart when you give. And you sure don't have to state a bad prayer because God already knows your heart. That thing, that thing that has been haunting you and has diminished you until you're about to lose your mind over it. God sent me to tell you, get up. Wash yourself off. Get your best clothes on. Meet me at the house of prayer. And when you get there, open your mouth so that I can move. It's over. You can't do a thing about it now. But I still got some blessings. I still got some anointing. I still got some territories to raise you up in. It's over! You can't redo that abortion. Oh, God. You're crying about, you're wondering in the night what the child could be. What you did, it's over. Cleanse us, Lord. Cleanse us. Cleanse us. Cleanse us. You wish you weren't so terrible when you were young, but it's over. Still blaming yourself. 
for what somebody did to you at 13. It's over. You can't be a victim all your life. It's over. It's over. Still trying to hide it. It's 15 years ago. So what if they find out? It's over. Uh, let the healing flow. Let the healing flow. Let the healing flow. Let the healing flow. Let it flow. You cry if you have to. If, if anybody ought to be benefited by your tears, it ought to be you. If anybody ought to benefit by your boo-hooing, it ought to be you. If anybody, it ought to be you. It's over. We got some praising to do. We got some worshiping to do. We got a mission yet to do. We got some visions yet to move in. We've got a life yet to live. God has anointed you for a purpose. Get up. Get up. The nation is waiting for you. Get up. The children of Israel need a king. Get up. Get up. Don't hurt yourself. Hallelujah. 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 Hold on to that person. Hold on to that person. Hold on to that person. Hold on, you know the secret thing, Lord. You know the secret thing. Now, Lord, purge now. Purge now. Cleanse now. Oh, God, send that anointing. Move it in these hands. Move it, move it, move it. Move it through them. Move it all over them. Move it now, Lord. Take that nightmare. I will not have another nightmare. I will not think that thought. I am free. I am delivered. It is behind me. It is over. I'm ready to walk in my vision. I'm ready to walk in my purpose. I'm ready to pick up where I left off. I've been six months, a year, ten months, seven months, years going through this, but it's over right now. In the name of Jesus, I command it done. In the name of Jesus, I command it fixed right now, right now. I think it was in verse 15 where David said, open your mouth and Lord, open my mouth, move through my lips. Let me praise you, let me lift you up, restore the joy of my salvation. I'm going to make it. I want you to celebrate. If you believe it's over, loose those hands, lift up your God. Celebrate, celebrate. and my past is behind me now. Touch three people real quick and tell them it's over. I, I got to go on. It's over. I'm moving to the next level. It's over. My mind is clear. I can see now. I can hear from God. It's over. Oh God. Hold it. I, I want you to shout one word. I want you to shout one word. I want you to shout just one word from the depth of your heart. Don't say it if you haven't received it, but I want you to shout as loud as you can. Deliver. what it is to be dead. 
Just wave those free and clear hands. God knows how to deal with sin. God knows how. And he'll never let you go. No man shall pluck them out of my hand. How many people in here thank God for second chances and third chances and fourth?